coming up on Elon Phoenix Weekly. The season is heating up for the Elon Phoenix football team in the early part of their season. We chat with a former Elon basketball star who is giving back to the next generation. And revisit one of the newest members of the Elon Athletic Hall of Fame. All that and more on Elon Phoenix Weekly. Good morning and welcome to Elon Phoenix Weekly. I'm Madeline Kern. And I'm Talia Lundquist. Thank you for joining us for this ESPN Local Sports Break. We have another wonderful show for you today, featuring connections from former Elon athletes to current success stories. That's right, Madeline. From twins on the football team to a former 1,000 point scorer from the women's basketball team who is now dishing assists off the court. All that coming up on our show. But first, Professional athletes are always in the spotlight for their service and contributions to their surrounding communities. That trend is now turning towards colleges as more student athletes are giving their time to organizations in need of volunteers. One Elon student athlete recently used her skills to help an organization near to her heart. Redshirt sophomore and track and field star Grace DeLapa has always felt she needed to volunteer. I've always had a love for helping out communities. In high school, I worked with a Habitat for Humanity and I enjoyed that experience so much and I learned a lot from it too. From helping out others in her community to helping those on her team, she's always been someone to go to if you needed help. Grace is a great friend and has always been really kind to me through all the ups and downs through college, so I've always appreciated her friendship and it's meant a lot to me. While Grace is a student athlete, Elon University requires all students to complete two of five experimental learning requirements. Grace found service as a requirement she wanted to focus on, choosing Habitat for Humanity as her organization. What they do is they are looking at building homes and hope and communities, and so that's primarily done through builds where they actually make homes. As I mentioned before, I always love to do the hands-on build stuff. Sarah Williams um, and I got connected and I wanted to do that experience again, so I reached out to her and she helped me get connected to Habitat. A requirement of the ELRs is to serve for 40 or more hours, but in addition to their service, they're required to reflect on those experiences as well. So we want students to connect that service to their own academics and to the greater issue or kind of cause at large. So for example, Grace worked with Habitat, but she also looked at some of the issues of poverty and housing and affordability and things like that. While doing extra research and writing can be a difficult task, the physical labor was the hardest. The most strenuous thing was putting up the trusses. Those were really heavy. We had like eight to ten of us putting up one truss on a house. And we also painted a lot and then hammered in some wood along the side of the house. Helping those around you with their projects can make a big impact on your own life. It can bring out different skills and characteristics things that you'd never imagined you were capable of. It takes a lot of people to build a house. A lot of trust and a lot of working together and, and figuring out how to best work with each other. I, I think she's more confident in the way she carries herself. She's really proud of what she's done and it really shows like she really loves to share her experiences with all of us um, and really wants us to become involved with all of this as well. Grace. She said in her final uh, piece of writing that she'd do it again in a heartbeat. And so she's already committed to kind of paying attention to possibly serving with habitats or around that issue for the rest of her life. One thing we know for sure is that Grace will never stop serving and giving to those around her. Grace has been forever impacted by her work with Habitat for Humanity. She says she's excited to do more work with them throughout her life. For more information on how you can volunteer with Habitat for Humanity, visit habitat.org slash volunteer. Leaving college and entering the professional worlds can be a challenge for any student. 
Women Influencers in Sport, or WINS, is a new initiative that offers regular programming to encourage the development and education of female students studying sport management. Through the program and its mentorship, female students gain the skills, knowledge, network, and confidence necessary to establish themselves in what is currently an overwhelmingly male-dominated industry. Mention the name Kelsey Harris at Elon, and you would conjure up images of a prolific scorer and an all-conference player with a wide array of skills. Now, Harris is an assistant director of basketball at the ACC, but still has a strong connection to Elon, and we had the chance to sit and chat with Kelsey about her new role with Elon as a current mentor to current students. I am the Assistant Director of Women's Basketball Operations at the Atlantic Coast Conference. Um, at our conference office, I'm responsible for three main things within the Women's Basketball Department. Um, regular season operations and logistics, um, conference tournament planning, and then officiating. In our conference office, I'd say we actually have about 40 to 50 percent of our office made up of women and they're in all different departments from championships logistics to our football department to men's basketball, women's basketball, business, marketing. Um, so from my experiences, women have opportunities everywhere and even just sports, especially sports industry in general, um, that is a, a progressive mindset that our office is, is trying to push. When I came into the industry, I sought out a mentor um, at the NCAA when I was there for their postgrad internship program. Um, her name was Anuka Brown, and at the time she was a vice president of women's basketball, and she pushed me in every aspect of, of work possible. Um, she challenged me to pursue other opportunities. She challenged me to go out and meet people, um, but she also just gave me advice um, from her own work experiences that changed my perspective and, and allowed me to think differently about different situations. Working in New York and being a part of the Elon in New York program really changed my entire life. Um, I had the opportunity to go to New York and, and intern with the New York Red Bulls arena and the MLS soccer team. And as an operations intern, I was there for three months and got to have real life work experience outside of North Carolina, which led me to pursue more, more opportunities in different areas and different locations. My advice to a young woman looking to start her career would be to seek out a mentor, but also just try to get involved um, in any aspect that she may be interested in. Because in, in my experience, I didn't know it, exactly what I wanted to do until I tried it. Students are lucky to have someone like Kelsey Harris to guide them through the process of e leaving Elon and entering the professional ranks. Harris is entering her second season with the ACC. We have a lot left on this edition of Elon Phoenix Weekly, including a special pair of brothers on the football team. And what is the most points you've ever seen in a football game? We have the story of a football game that almost broke the scoreboard. Stay with us. driving course since my freshman year and I couldn't be more excited. We grind early in the morning and in the heat of the day. We have the work ethic. Every day, we set our sights higher, staying focused on what's next. We have the momentum. Together, we are on the rise.
Welcome back to Elon Phoenix Weekly on your ESPN2 local sports break. Every year, Elon Athletics inducts a class of their best athletes over the years. The class of 2018 included men's tennis standout Damon Gooch, football All-American Terrell Hudgens, and men's golfer Jimmy Lytle. Gooch was the conference freshman of the year, a two-time team captain, and was the team MVP three times over his four years at Elon. His senior year, Gooch was named Elon's Outstanding Male Athlete of the Year. He sat down with Elon Phoenix Weekly to chat about his time with the Phoenix. I always sort of had a dream to play college tennis and uh, what I did in South Africa before internet, <laughs> I went to an internet cafe and I went online and created an email, which I did not have. And I went down and I looked at every university I could find an email for and I sent out emails. And um, I developed a relationship with multiple coaches and one of the coaches was Coach Leonard. And uh, that fit best. I really liked Coach right off the bat over the phone and came to Elon's side unseen. Senior year, last match I ever played actually. Um, uh, second round of the NCAAs, just, just being on the court is my favorite memory. Just, just being in that moment, I really was, was able to feel everything that had happened the last four years in that moment and the match was one of those matches where it just kind of flowed. Um, I, did, I didn't win, so usually when a match flows you win, but I actually didn't, but it, it, it was like that and win or lose, it was just it was my favorite memory. When I was about 26, I got the itch and I thought, okay, you know what, I know what I want to do with this money and I'm going to go play. And it turned out that that's kind of when Cameron was, was graduating, so it was, it was perfect. So we, we jumped out and we, we played some doubles tournaments together and I started a, a pro career that lasted four years. Um, I would have liked it to have lasted longer and I would have liked it to have started earlier, but um, I got to play and, and I feel really fortunate about that. Who I was in life before Elon was very different to who I was in life after Elon. And Elon was sort of that place where I had that turning point and, and that set me up to where I am now. I have an education from Elon. I'm actually in finance, which I didn't think I would be, but that was my concentration when I was here. Um, I have a wife and a newborn, and, and one of my dreams was to live in America, and I'm doing that, and, and Elon put that together for me and, and put me where I am today. Gooch holds Elon's Division I record with 64 career dual single wins and ranks second with 67 career dual double wins. During his senior year, Gooch advanced to the round of 32 in the NCAA tournament. We shift from the court to the diamond, and in particular, the final four left standing in Major League Baseball. Well, it's October, and that can only mean one thing for baseball fans, playoffs. I'm here to tell you the four things to watch for this October. The defending champs, Houston Astros, came into the postseason sporting the highest team batting average at 255 second among current playoff teams. This being said, while the long ball is popular and entertaining, the Astros know the key to success in the playoffs is consistent hitting. The combination of Alex Bregman, Jose Altuve, a healthy Carlos Correa, and the reigning World Series MVP George Springer is a menace to any opposing pitching staff. David Price continues to be the one major question for the Boston starting pitching group. In his two postseason starts thus far, he has allowed a total of seven earned runs. His career postseason ERA is 5.42, and while his contribution has been somewhat lacking for the Sox, his offense has been able to pick up his slack, putting up gaudy numbers as they have all season. While the other Red Sox starters hold better postseason ERAs than Price, the Red Sox hitters will have to add on a lot of runs in order to keep up with the Astros. The Dodgers are a team of personality. Their main goal is to bring energy and flair to the diamond. No one does that better than Manny Machado. Machado, a mid-season acquisition for Dave Roberts' club, was no slouch once he put on the Dodger blue. In the second half of the season, Machado led the team in total at-bats, hits, home runs, RBIs, and total bases. While Machado adds flair and popularity to the team, Justin Turner has continued to play the role of clutch vet for the club, launching a two-run home run to secure their first win in the NLCS. The Brewers have no shortage of offense, as they hold claim to the likely NL MVP, Christian Yelich. During the regular season, Yelich led the Brewers in batting average, 
home runs, RBIs, on-base percentage, and hits. During his somewhat underwhelming postseason thus far, the Brew Crew is more than just Yelich. With Lorenzo Cain, Jesus Aguilar, and Mike Moustakis hitting around Yelich, the Brew Crew puts together a tough at-bat at each spot. A sort of dark horse out of the NL, the Brewers have been no stranger to winning their fair share of games. As Brewers Hall of Fame radio broadcaster Bob Euchre said, this team is capable, very capable. So, who will win it all? I'm sticking with Euchre. Brewers over the Red Sox in six. Thank you, Tellier. We will see if your prediction of the Brewers holds up as we finish up the playoffs at the end of October. We have plenty of television to show you when we return. A new episode of The Spark taking you behind the scenes of the early part of the football season. Plus, we have the story of a local football game that you won't believe. When Elon Phoenix Weekly returns. We grind early in the morning and in the heat of the day. We have the work ethic. Every day, we set our sights higher, staying focused on what's next. We have the momentum. Together, we are on the rise. Swing and a miss. And it gets the stop. So Jones has it knocked down by Klein. For someone, Sebring takes a deep three. Elon Phoenix Weekly is made possible by the students of the School of Communications in association with the dedicated coaches, athletes, and staff of Elon Athletics. For any team, the bond that grows between players is nurtured through practices, travel, living together, and games. The wins and losses bring players together, but for two teammates, the strong bond began much earlier than when they strapped on helmets for the football team. In today's episode of The Spark, we learn about how the journey of being a part of this Elon football team has brought a set of twins even closer together. Charleston Southern. I mean, we played a lot of triple option teams before, so you know, we kind of knew what we were getting ourselves into. And we had a game plan of, you know, really it's just assignment football. You know, one person has the QB, one person has the running back, and it's really just about making tackles. struggle a little bit. Coach told us that, you know, we're a good football team. We can beat these guys. All we got to do is do everything that we worked on in practice. We got back to that, got focused, locked in, and good things happen.
coming back like that. It shows that we have a lot of resilience. It shows that, you know, we're not just going to give up when times get tough, you know. So I think that was really good to see from our defense. Just to see the adversity and how we handled it, you know, it was a good thing to see because, you know, it's not going to be a walk in the park in the CAA. <laughs> Great job. Okay, come back in the second half the way we did. All right? The lesson here is pretty simple. You got to always have an edge when you go out there and play. Because if you don't, you end up at halftime like we did. And we came out and played with poise and effort in the second half. Hey, seven, one, three, seven, one, three, one, two, three. Hey! hey. hey. They've had to be. They've had to be fighters. They they were born premature. Um, things were a little scary. They sign. You're sign. Yeah, you just one month early. They've been together since day one. They've been teammates. They've been roommates. Um, and they they really pretty much they do get along. Thank God because they're together a lot. We didn't bicker a lot as kids. We were each other's best friends. I guess that transitioned into football. We worked well together. You know, he was my offensive lineman when I was a running back. He was my defensive lineman when I was a linebacker. When they were in high school and being recruited, the schools that were looking at them, most of them were CAA, and they would have played against each other. So, you know, when Elon came along, it was just, it's the perfect fit. Well, things got off to kind of a rough start for both of them. We tore our left labrums. I tore mine the third day of camp. He tore his like the first scrimmage. And the nurses were just confused because they looked on the board and they had just brought Eric back and they said, well, that's Eric Whitehead, born 12, 17, 96. But there's an R Whitehead in the operating room, born 12, 17, 96, with the same injury. And, you know, they just kind of looked at us and we're like, we said, yeah, they do everything together. It's kind of like I just grew up with my best friend my entire life. I didn't realize how important a brother was until college. You know, a lot of people struggle to find friends, but you know, I always had a friend and a roommate all, all four years here. So it was just nice, you know, going through all the time, difficult times you go through in college, just having that one person by your side. I get asked a lot if it's weird that we play in college together, but it really, since we've always done it, we've always played together. So it's really, it just feels like the, like the norm. Yeah, you and Ace, they've been a really good football team. You know, they made the playoffs, I think, for the past 14 years. So, you know, we knew we were going to have to do our job. You know, we got back to our bread and butter plays and we just executed. On the goal line sack, uh, we, we were running the play, so I was blitzing the V-gap. And you know, the guard, he, he came on me. I ended up slipping off of him and um, kind of able to push him outside, so then Willoughby was able to get the sack. So, you know, it was good teamwork, you know, good effort on both, both guys there. Just having these coaches come in here and and show us and teach us new things, new techniques. It's great. It feels good to be able to win games. They started off as preferred walk-ons, as my husband mentioned. Um, they worked really hard. They were here all year long. They, they came in the summer. They did whatever the scholarship players were doing. They were here. They did classes. They did workouts. But this is what they really wanted to do. So last year, Coach Signetti called them both in, and they were awarded scholarships. 
So the scholarship that I was awarded was the uh, Mark Foley scholarship, and he was also a former walk-on at Elam who then earned a scholarship. He, when he, uh, he passed away, his friends and family decided to start a scholarship in his name for those players who went through a similar situation, who was a walk-on, then awarded a scholarship. And I got the opportunity to meet Mr. Foley this past week after UNH, and he was just telling me all these great stories about him, uh, how he was just a hard player. He loved the sport, loved his teammates, and they wanted to make sure that his legacy lived on. And I feel like it's my duty now to make sure that his legacy lives on so that the next person who's awarded the scholarship can continue that and that his name is never forgotten. And going through scout team, it's a lot, it's rough, you know, 30 minutes to an hour of just getting killed by the, the first teamers is not very fun, but you know, just, we both worked so hard for this, you know, we played football together since we were freshmen in high school. So just getting it the same day just meant a lot. It's one of the proudest moments um, and they did it. It was all, it was all them. I mean, this was all their hard work and they love this team. They love this school. Um, they love this game. Okay, Tellier, I know we normally stay on campus to tell a great story about Elon, but there's one football game that happened just down the road that is worthy of mentioning. If we said that Davidson scored 91 points, would you assume we were talking about the basketball team? However, the Wildcats, who play in the same football championship division as Elon, they decided to match up against Division Three Guilford College a few weeks ago. And the results were record-breaking. Guilford actually led 6-0 in the first quarter, but then the track meet began. The final score, Davidson 91, Guilford 61. That's right, Guilford scored 61 points and lost by 30. Davidson had 57 points by the end of the first half. The combined point total of 152 almost set an FCS single game scoring record. The Wildcats averaged 15 points five yard per play and eight of their 13 touchdowns were longer than 50 yards. Eight different players scored touchdowns for Davidson and just for good measure, Corey Coppola blocked three kicks as well. The Quakers, whose head coach said he wasn't mad at Davidson, rather he was disappointed with his defense, also set several school records for all purpose yards and kickoff return yards. Well, regardless of who you're playing, that is a ton of points. Oh yeah, definitely. Like you gotta wonder, where's their defense? I mean, if I'm in the Davidson organization, I would probably be fire firing my defensive coordinator. That is unacceptable. I know. Think about it. Davidson's a D1 school, and they gave up that many points to a D3 school. That just should not be happening. It should definitely not be happening. If you missed anything or want to watch it again, be sure to check us out on YouTube at youtube.com/elonphoenixweekly. You can also catch us on Spectrum Cable to watch us on demand. Head to elonphoenix.com to learn more about upcoming games and exciting success stories for Elon Athletics. And don't forget to tune in next time when we return for another exciting edition of Elon Phoenix Weekly. On behalf of our producers and crew here at the show, we hope you have a great weekend. For the Elon Phoenix Weekly, I'm Taylor Lundquist. And I'm Madeline Kern. Live the maroon life. Go Phoenix.